Hey everyone, I am Mark from On The Wrong Lead, and as a number of you are aware, this past weekend I played in a tournament called the Breeders' Cup Betting Challenge. Um, did quite well, had a pretty massive score, uh, it could be considered a life changer if you, if you want to, um, had a great time, and I wanted to go through and kind of cover, uh, you know, what happened and how it all shook out, and uh, give people a little bit of a, a little bit of an overview of the BCBC and what it's like. Um, so this is not going to be a handicapping video. I'm not going to sit here and explain how I handicapped the races. Uh, if you're looking for that content, watch either of our live streams uh, for the Friday card or for the Saturday card. Those are going to be much better sequences, much better. Um, and, you know information on how I handicap because if you watch those streams every horse that I liked and every horse that I played on the tournament I mentioned if you heard me say something along the lines of I like this horse or I love this horse in this spot um, those were those were my press plays uh, I didn't didn't uh, didn't hide anything I, I was pretty transparent with what I liked and why I liked them um, what this is gonna really detail is the actual physical plays I put on for the Breeders Cup um, you know what you know how I spent that money um, and really kind of going through some of the mentality what was going on in my head as I was making some pretty you know uh, unequivocally stupid plays absolutely monster slams um, going on in this tournament so uh, I later on will detail all of those um, you know so that you can have an understanding of every single play I played every single thing I was thinking as I played that play uh, it's something a bunch of people had asked about so I said okay I'm sure I'll throw it together so if you're if you're unfamiliar with the Breeders' Cup betting challenge and what it is, it's the largest, richest, and most prestigious live money tournament in the world. It covers the two days of the Breeders' Cup. You can bet into any single race. And um, it's, uh, yeah, it's, it's kind of the deep end of the pool as far as live money tournaments go. Uh, and I should mention, the only race you cannot bet on is the last race on Saturday, which is not a Breeders' Cup race. It's just a regular allowance race. Uh, is at least as the card was played um, at this past Breeders' Cup. And just so everybody's aware, I did fly out to Santa Anita. I was on track for the event. You don't have to be on track. You can play it from home or from other satellite locations if you want to. Uh, it's a $10,000 buy-in tournament. Yeah, that means that if you want to buy an entry, you cut a check for $10,000. Of that $10,000, 2,500 of that is set aside for a prize pool. Prize pool goes to the top 50 or top 20 entrants, um, and obviously it's it's pyramided in a way that the top person gets most of that prize pool, um, and the person the you know in 20th gets the least amount of the prize pool. So uh, 20th got a little over $11,000, and first place got a little over $411,000. So pretty big chunk of change. 571 total entrants. Um, there are th three Mando races on Friday and seven on Saturday. Now that does not mean that uh, you have to play a Mando race. What it means is that on Friday, there were five total Breeders' Cup races. You had to play three of them where you had at least $600 um, in wagers in that one race. For it to count in a Breeders' Cup race, the wagers had to start in a Breeders' Cup race. So I played a lot of daily doubles, so what I had to do is make sure my daily doubles started in a Breeders' Cup race, and then um, you know they could go into the next race. And I had to have at least 600 in total wagers. It doesn't need to be one wager. You can place multiple wagers. So you could do something along the lines of, oh, you know, I want a $300 to win, a uh, $100 exacta, uh, and you know, a $100 daily double. Um, you know, $100 two horse box exacta for 200, and a $100 straight, you know, double. That would equal up to, when you do all the math, $600, and that's a totally legitimate wager uh, to play. Play in something like the uh, to play in something like the BCBC, um, and you do, and you also have to churn all seventy five hundred dollars. Uh, you know you're, you have ten mandos. That's six thousand dollars in in wagers. You can, by the way, wager above the six hundred dollars in any of those spots, um, which I did quite a few times. I'll show you that here in a minute. Um, but you have to churn your entire bankroll. You have to total wager seventy five hundred dollars uh, over the two days. 
Um, you know, for me, this is my personal holy grail as a tournament. Uh, for you know, I think live money tournaments, uh, they're more similar to going to the track on a day. You have a certain bankroll when you walk in the door, and you plan on deploying that bankroll to try to get as much money back as you possibly can. Um, and I should mention, I haven't yet, the there you are somewhat limited on wager types in the in the BCBC. Um, the options you have are win, play, show, exacta, trifecta, and daily double um, wagers. You can't use any of the two-day wagers. You can't use any of like a pick three, a pick four, a pick five. And you can't use the two-day special doubles. So it has to be just the regular wagers. Um, and I got in off a $179 qualifier. What that means is that I went to horse tourneys or horse players, whichever one it was. I entered into a tournament. Um, and uh, won my entry for $179. I, get, I had a qualifying budget that I played with, uh, meaning that I, I sat down and I said, geez, I really want to get into BCBC this year. I'm willing to risk this amount playing in qualifiers to try to get in. And uh, I played three qualifiers and got in on the third qualifier. So um, was pretty darn happy to get in, pretty darn happy to be there. And uh, you know, I'm, I'm very happy with my results. Um, all you know, as I go through my goals, I, I probably should mention I made a lot of money, and people are going to look at it and hear me being very critical of the fact that I didn't make more money than I did. That's more me being a very goal oriented person. Um, I want to win when I show up. I want to do the best I possibly can, um, and I'm also somebody that. Every day I cap at the track, I go back after the fact and I look at my plays. What did I play? Why did I play it? Was it a smart play? And I'm always critiquing myself and I'm always trying to be better. So you're going to hear me kind of beating myself up a bit. Um, that's more for the fact that I want to be better the next time I do something like this. I want to have a better experience. Um, so my goals going into the tournament were to have fun and really kind of enjoy the experience. Um, you know, it's a it's two days a year you get to play on this kind of thing. It's a ten thousand dollar tournament. You got seventy five hundred dollars in cash that you can fire away with. Um, you know, it's uh, a lot of degeneracy going on, which I'll I'll explain later on. Um, and you know, it's. Uh, you, you want to have fun, and it's also the Breeders' Cup. And this was the, actually the first Breeders' Cup that I had ever been to. Never had actually been on track for a Breeders' Cup. Definitely watched a lot of them, play a lot of them online, but never been on track for one. So uh, two firsts, and I, and I wanted to make sure I really enjoyed the moment I had fun. So I uh, you know throughout the weekend, and I'll show some photos at the end, made time to go around and, uh, you know, there's a lot of people I talk with about horses on a regular basis. And I made sure that I visited as many of them who were on track as I possibly could. Uh, so just to you know, make sure that, I had fun and it wasn't too serious. Um, my, my second goal was to raise capital to slam my best opinions. You're gonna see when I, I start talking through the races, um, my best opinions were late in the sequences on uh, you know, on Saturday. So I wanted to make sure I had as much capital available to fire at those sequences as, as I possibly could have. Um, so the idea was raise capital, make big plays at those best opinions. So absolutely slam those best opinions. And I wanted to finish top 20. I wanted to get in the prize pool. That was my, that was my, you know, overall goals. Um, and, um, yeah. So the plan as I walked in and looked at the races, um, I'm a person that spends a lot of time handicapping. Uh, I probably put 20 hours of handicapping into the Breeders' Cup, maybe more. And I was, I had horses on the brain. Uh, you'll actually see, and, and I try to do this as a bit of a joke, I put out a lot of YouTube shorts and there's like me going to a Halloween party talking about Breeders' Cup races. Um, my brain was just revolving around Breeders' Cup and, and revolving around horse racing for two weeks prior to the tournament. And I'm somebody that comes in with a plan. So what I actually did is I, is I wrote out all my handicapping as I normally do ABC structure, like I was playing a pick five or something. And then I found the chunks of the card that I liked the best. And I found the plays that were eligible to me that I could slam the best. So I wrote them top to bottom. My best plan on the weekend is this. My second best is this. And I wanted to raise capital to fire towards those best opinions. Um, my again my best opinions were late on the card saturday so i needed to survive friday and not burn too much money i didn't have a lot of good opinions at all um and i'll talk about how i played it versus probably what's the optimal way to play it which is not what i did um not mad at myself for how i played it but uh you know always live and learn um 
you know, I had my four best plays on Saturday, which I'll show everybody what those were here in a bit. Uh, and I just wanted to slam them. Uh, and my plan was whatever capital I had sitting in the bank, 100% of it was going to go through August Rodan and the turf. Um, and I'll explain why I didn't end up doing that, why I am kind of kicking myself for not ending up doing that. Um, but uh, but I'll, I'll give you the details as we move along. Um, and my best plays were the dirt mile to the Philly and Mare turf, the distaff to the turf, the turf sprint to the sprint. Those were all three doubles. Those were where I felt where I felt the best three sort of doubles that I have. And, I, and I'm I'm a player that thinks that way. Um, you know, I think in a kind of a vertical mindset. So I I used a lot of doubles. Most of my big plays were actually all of my big plays were doubles. Um, and I and I and also I think when you make a plan on races, you have to have an understanding of where you don't have good opinions. So I did not have solid opinions in the Philly Mare Sprint, the Mile, or the Classic. So my idea was um, because I have those seven mandatories and I didn't want to miss a mandatory, I played horizontally in those races, which is not something I'm super comfortable with. So uh, we'll talk about that a little bit as we get going on here. But I did play horizontally in a couple of those spots. Um, they were definitely make the mins, but a little bit of poke and pray type type of plays. Um, you know, a lot of geez, I'll play wrap some horizontals, make some exactas where I have some prices or some trifectas where I have some prices, and hopefully I hit one of those and I can use that capital someplace else. Um, and then I also had the mindset I loved the exacta in the sprint. Um, I thought that it was a two horse race, and I thought that. Also, just due to a pace complexion standpoint, and especially being a sprint, um, it, it would go, you know, the two top horses would go one and two. I didn't see a, a way that that didn't happen. So my thought was, if I'm in a spot where I either need to hold my position or I'm trying to make a last minute big move, I could slam the exacta in that race and that would, uh, that would accomplish that for me. So on Friday, here are my plays. Give me one second here. Um, I played four plays. So you're going, you're, and this is how the format is going to be for all of my plays. You're going to see the race number. So the, if you read the top line, it's race two. I played a five over two, four, 12, 13 daily double for a hundred dollars base wager, meaning that that cost me $400 to play. Um, and you're all gonna see, you're gonna see them all in the base wager amount. That's how I, how I structured it instead of the total cost of the play. Then, then you're gonna see a little vertical line, and the next thing is negative 400. So I completely whiff that wager, and my bankroll at the end of that wagering sequence, at the end of that daily double, was down to $7,100. I got nothing back, I completely whiffed. Now, race two was an interesting spot. Um, it was the only, well, actually, technically race three was the race I was interested in. Race two, uh, there was a maiden who had had a big performance on debut. I thought the horse was a lock, so I fired a double. Um, I whiffed the first leg. Um, but my initial plan was race three, I went through and capped all the races, and race three on the weekend was the one where I thought the highest level of variance was. Uh, variance is just that when you look at a race and you think it's flat, you feel like, gee, the, the difference between the favorite and maybe the horse I think it's fifth best is really, really small. And if you do those kind, if you find those kind of races and target them, those are the races that produce big payouts because the difference between the best horse and the worst horse is very slim. And I like to find those kind of races. And I thought that um, you know, daily doubling into that second leg, uh, the 12 was the favorite, but the in race three, I thought the 12 was gonna be like seven to two or four to one kind of range as the favorite. Um, and the two, four and the 13 were all horses that were eight or 10 to one. Um, I was trying to create some value there, trying to do a little bit of capital raise. I thought it was the best spot to do that on Friday. So I took a shot. I completely whiffed both legs. I whiffed the, whiffed the first leg, didn't the, uh, the last out maiden breaker did not come back and win again. And in the second leg, I actually also screwed up. Um, I was right about it being a high variance race. Uh, Jose Ortiz won on a horse that went off at like 20 to one or something, a big price. Um, but uh, I did not um, I did not end up you know, collecting there. I, I, I didn't have that horse right. So um, you're gonna see my, my, my wagering total got into 7,100. And then you're gonna see three other, a daily double, an exact a box, and another daily double um, in races five, seven, and nine. I missed all three of those wagers, um, and I'm completely fine with those. The, the idea on Friday was survive, make your minimums, and hopefully raise a little capital you can use on Saturday. Um, I failed at the last part, but I think I took okay shots. Now, with that being said, 
the game theory optimal sort of way to play this kind of thing is if you don't have an opinion not to do what i did what you would what i should have done in a perfect world should have done would be to play three six hundred dollar show bets on maybe the first or second choice in those races the idea is you're going to get some return that's going to give you a little more capital which moves you up the leaderboard and you're going to have a better chance of uh, you know, being able to make those bigger plays on the next day doing that if you really have no opinions. Now, I took a bit of a hybrid approach and my approach was, I, I wasn't really reaching out. You're gonna see I did use some somebody like in race five there. Um, I, I you know doubled in, or uh, I doubled into Tamara, right? Um, I played those kind of things where, um, where I was okay sort of taking the logical. Um, I do kick myself a little for the Tamara race. I did like the Billmount horse that won. That was the only other horse in the race I liked. And I'm getting like two to five on Tamara or I'm getting eight to one on a Billmount horse. And of course I fire the, the double into uh, into Tamara because I'm a chalk hitting weasel. Um, but, uh, you, know, I, uh, you know, I think I took okay stabs here. Um, I didn't want to take that show bet wager route because okay, I'm going to be show betting first or second choice. And yeah, my $600 is going to return $650. Game theory optimal, that's the best way to play. But I played four wagers. If I collect on one of those wagers, I make more than I would have playing three $600 show bets. And my, my, my logic was I probably connect on one. Now I didn't hindsight being 2020 and all, but I could have connected on two and been way ahead of that. So I think long term, I'm fine with this. I had no real real um, issues with how I played it, except for the fact that I'm going into day two at $5,300. So here, you're going to see a lot of wagers. So on Saturday, um, came in with 5,300. I like the race two daily double, that 611 over 35 daily double. Um, Ended up firing it for two fifty, so a thousand dollars. And I also should mention, you're going to see in brackets in a large capital M. Those are any wager that qualifies as a mandatory wager. I forgot to mention that on the free previous page, um, just so you understand where the mandos fell. And you're going to see, like in race nine, there's two mando wagers. I actually made two wagers that would have qualified as mandatories, um, but just just for transparency's sake. So. Uh, race two, you're going to see I played a big daily double, completely whiffed on that, down to $4,300. Um, now you're getting a little panicky because you're playing this with this mindset of, okay, I have seven mandatories I need to make. Uh, seven mandatories uh, was, what, $4,200. I would only have, if I whiffed all of them, I'd have $100 in the bank. Um, now, the thing with the mandatories is the penalty, I think, for missing one mandatory is $10,000. I think you lose ten grand. So you want to make them, but obviously if you're gonna just make your mandatories and end up with nothing at the end, there's no point. So what most people do is they have spots where they're gonna take big stabs. I probably had a mindset of making my mandatories that was a little too strong. I was a little too concerned about making the mandatories um, and not strong enough on making the most money. So anyways, uh, race two, I thought that was a good value proposition spot. It did not turn out to be. Um, I, I liked what the doubles were paying in that spot. And that was one of the, uh, when I, again, when I wrote these down, I wrote my best plays down, but I also wrote ones where I thought I would get a nice value line that the, the profit you know, point, the profitability would be very, very strong. So race three, um, you're going to look at that and anybody who knows that race is going to give me crap. Uh, I expect a whole lot of, uh, a whole lot of crap from my on the wrong league co-hosts if they actually watch this far into the video, because I, uh, I played a really stupid wager. Um, I played a daily double and I like Cody's wish in that spot. He was a hard horse to beat, but as anybody that knows me knows that I have a soft spot for Charge It. I've had a soft spot for Charge It for a really long time, and occasionally Charge It shows up, fires a huge performance, and wins a big race. So what I should have done in this spot is I should have played something like maybe a $500 daily double that was three over six nine, and that would have given me a large amount of money through Cody's wish into the doubles in the next leg. And then what I should have done is played a much smaller charge it over the six and nine in the next leg daily double. So how it probably should have been is like a $500 daily double um, that was three over six, nine and a second daily double, it's maybe 50 or a hundred dollars, five over six, nine. 
Um, it wasn't. It was a pretty poor structure. Now I did make nine hundred and fifteen dollars on the wager, um, and there was, you know, um, and what you're gonna see if you're, you're waiting there and going, wait, the math doesn't make sense. So I, I made nine hundred and fifteen dollars. That's what the wager returned as a hundred and fifty dollar daily double. Um, but the wager cost me six hundred dollars to make. So the net is three hundred and fifteen in profit, which is why the the total at the end goes forty three to forty six fifteen. So, you know, I, I think that wager was, um, it was not, it was the right idea, just poor structure. It's one of those ones I, sh I should have played two wagers, but honestly where my head was at at this point in time was, okay, you whiffed four wagers the day before, you just whiffed on another big wager to start the day, you just need to score, you need to cash, you need to get, you know, kind of turn the tide and get some money coming into, you know, coming in. So I played something that was a very conservative way of approaching a daily double instead of an aggressive way. And you still have to stay aggressive. So um, it should have been two daily doubles if I did like charge it a bit. And I did honestly like him a bit in that spot. Um, so yeah, I made 915, cool. So it goes into the race five. Race five was a race, that's the Goodnight Olive race, um, the Philly and Mare sprint. And I didn't like that race. I thought Goodnight Olive could win, but I knew she was gonna be three to five. And I thought there was a bunch of other prices in there that were really interesting. And I also thought there was a chance, you know, we know no Goodnight Olive didn't like to run inside horses. Um, and she's a horse that's very talented, but she might not have that turn button, you know, blow through a hole kind of move. So she, there's been times where she's gotten boxed in inside. And when she gets loose, yeah, she can grind down a winner, but she doesn't have that crazy turn of foot. Um, also, she is a very fast horse and very talented. I'm not trying to make an argument that way. Um, but what I did is I talked with Chase Sessoms, the, the Wolf of Oaklawn, and I said, hey, Chase, I want to trifecta here. Um, and the, my logic was if I could get Goodnight Olive out of first place, um, and I had two prices that were beating her, and then I could wheel her maybe in second and third, but the op optimal way is to get her completely out of there. But I had enough coverage where maybe I could get rid of her out off from it, you know, off from the top three completely. Um, yes, I'm wagering. It's a twenty-five dollar trifecta. It cost me six hundred dollars to play it. E there is a lot of risk there, but my thought was I could see this trifecta coming back been paying 300 if, if good and Olive misses the try this could pay three or four hundred dollars and i didn't think that was a crazy outsider chance i thought there was actually a fairly decent chance of that happening so how i ended up structuring it was good and Olive in second and third um you know she could be in second and third along with a bunch of other horses and uh the five ended up being a horse that i thought if the race completely came apart was the most interesting player now none of the other favorites went with her um, none of the other favorites honestly showed up at all uh, and it was a pretty, um, yeah, and, and so my, my wager ended up being a complete whiff with Goodnight Olive winning. Had no problems with Goodnight Olive winning. She's a really great horse. She's really cool. Um, but it was, again, $600 down. And I should mention as well, there is a board that you're watching. Um, you know, there are two rooms where they hold the BCBC, and you, there's also an online website you can go to where they're showing an updated leaderboard. <clears throat> the day one leaderboard was absurd. There was a gentleman who was in both first and second place. He, You can buy two entries. He did buy two entries. And he had one of his entries at 67,000 and another one at like 43,000 at the end of day one. And then the gap to third place was just massive. So I'm already in this mindset of, after day one, I had the mindset of, geez, I can't win. This guy's just gonna run away with this. He's gone. There, there's, there's no way I'm gonna catch him. Um, and that definitely did play into how I played things today because I wasn't playing with a mindset of, oh, I can go catch that guy. I was playing with a mindset of, well, get home the biggest score you can. Take home as much money as you can. Um, the win is out of consideration. And, and that's a really bad mindset, especially in something like this with the Breeders' Cup where you, know, you can get those prices and you can make those big moves forward. Um, race seven is where I started finally getting things done. Now you saw on the previous page, I said I thought August Rodan was a single and I did. Um, and this was my play of, I got rid of Clarier and the distaff. I didn't like her there at all. And I was going to get, I was gonna fire into August Rodan who was the five horse in race um, eight. 
Um, so I played a thousand dollar daily double from the four eight. I caught the favorite, which was fine. Um, actually, my four and my eight, I think, ran first and second, which was I, I probably could have played an exacta there as well. But you know, I, again, that's not how I really think. I tend to think more doubles in this type of sequence. And I put a thousand dollar double on August Rodin. So I uh, paid ten five. And suddenly I'm sitting at 12, 5, 15 and going, oh God, I went from being, you know, because after, the other thing you have to remember is when you see these, the account, the amount in my account, after I play that trifecta and, and race five, you look at your account balance and it's, you know, because it was, you know, it, it was, it was low and you start getting panicky and you're worried about playing wagers and you want to save plays for later on you don't want to be in a spot where geez i have i'm gonna sit here because I, I, I was gonna watch all the races anyways but geez i have five races to play i don't have any money to play them that's left in my account balance and then find out that i was super right in the last five races and i would have run that money back up so you're 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 really worried about or i was really worried about money in reserve money still sitting in my bank account that was dry powder that i could apply someplace else um, but yeah, so that one, that double paid 10.5, um, ran me up to 12.515, um, and all of a sudden you're back alive again. And uh, and then I also played in race eight, and this is probably where I made the biggest mistake that I can actually. I mean, some of these I'm pointing out things that I'm saying. Geez, I wish I'd played this a little better. I wish I'd been a little smarter here. Things like that uh, that daily double in the in the in the um, Caleb in the uh, in race three. Um, but race eight was one where I really did screw up. Um, I played a double from race eight into the uh, into the classic, um, and I used the six, eight, and eleven, knowing that I was throwing away the favorite. Um, I thought White of Barrio could bounce. I thought there were a lot of other question marks there, so I didn't use White of Barrio, and I used three other horses. If you read my notes, going back a couple of pages here, let me see if I can flip back here. You're going to notice right in the middle of the page, all in to August Rodin. Um, I didn't place an all-in win bet. Uh, at this point, I had, you know, I'm, I played, uh, I had yet to cash that race seven double. So I still had four grand in reserve though. I should have spent that $4,015. Um, you know, I should have spent that that money that I had sitting in reserve. Actually, I'm uh, I'm, I'm lying here. It would have been 2015 because I would have taken the 4,015, made a 2,000 dollar wager. So I would have had 2,015 dollars sitting in reserve. I should have placed a 2,015 dollar bet on Augusta Rodin. That was what I said I was going to do. I just didn't do it. Um, and and that definitely cost me later on because um, that is you know that win bet. Yeah, you horse only went off at two to one. But that's another six grand that I could have taken, rolled forward, and uh, and fired into later races. Um, so yeah, um, and I also mentioned, and this is also sort of another one of those. You can see I made two wagers in race nine. Um, obviously, I was tossing the favorite, um, and I played a six eight ten exact a box. I don't hate either of these wagers. My biggest thing was that I made both of them. Um, I had mentioned that I didn't like the classic. I thought it was a really wide open race. A big price winning would not have surprised me. And if that's your mindset, um, you don't want to be deploying a bunch of capital at both both sequences. And I had written both down as possible wagers, but I didn't need to play them both. Um, the smart move would have been just to play the exacta and probably play it more like a $50 exacta. Now, the problem there with doing that is, um, again, it's going to be hindsight, you know, it's 2020 result oriented thinking, but if that exacta does come in, it probably pays quite a bit because I got weight of RL completely off from the, the exacta. Um, and then you're mad you didn't play it for bigger. But probably that play should have or could have been smaller um, because that was a race I just didn't like. And then we're gonna get into my best opinion, and I'm happy with how I played this given the capital that I had in reserve. The only thing here is, um, you know, when you get to race 10, um, this is the no balls into elite power race. Um, I thought that that no balls race was a two horse race. I said so on the stream. And I thought the the elite power gun race was a two horse race. Um, so I really like this play. I think this is probably my best play on the weekend. My only thing I would quit critique here is the wager amount. I still had, um, you know, after playing a four thousand dollar wager off ninety three sixty five, uh, I still had fifty three sixty five sitting in reserve. I still had five grand back. 
that could have very easily, even with the capital I had, been a $2,000 daily double. Um, I could have pressed much harder there because I, I think that was, you know, August Rodin and that double were my top two as I wrote in order of, uh, of preferred plays. So, you know, again, it's rearward biased, it's hindsight's 2020, it's results oriented thinking, it's all the things. Yes, I did cash a $41,200 daily double, which to most people is absolutely absurd and stupid and like didn't realize that you could do things like that. Um, but looking back on it, um, I, I do have to say, I wish I had played that at a larger amount. And also, if I had you know, simply win bet the rest of my balance on August Rodin, which was my best opinion on the weekend, um, I have a lot more capital to deploy there. You know, again, it would have been another six grand. It would have been easy to say, geez, I can still leave that five grand in reserve um, and, and play a $2,000 daily double. Um, so yeah, I, I kind of kicked myself about that one. And, and I guess where I keep mentioning this $5,000 in reserve number, um, where that came from, A, it's something that should have never been in my head, but it was. But where it was coming from was um, I had to last minute book flights and last minute book a hotel. It was fairly expensive to get out there. It cost me about two grand for the weekend. Uh, and my thought was, okay, I played a 179 feeder. If I turn a 179 feeder and do three grand in outlay, after and I cover all my expenses so I get a free Breeders Cup weekend a really nice experience and I take home 3k off a 179 feeder I'd be really happy that got in my head somehow that got to the fact you know my my head went to the fact of if I blow my bankroll I'm losing money and I got nothing out of anything um, and, and that's just the, that mindset should never happen and it really can't happen in a tournament like this. So I definitely should have been more aggressive in, uh, in that spot and with that sort of, with that sort of play type. Um, got into race 11 and the problem is you're going to see my account, my account you're going to be like, wait, you had 46.5 in your account. Well, the problem is the race 10 double doesn't cash out until the end of race 11. So I actually didn't. I was sitting in my, my account, but I did have um about five grand another six so i had four ish grand in my account um and i played a just a min bet i played a 300 hundred dollar exacta it cost 600 dollars. that cashed as well for another 2400 dollars when uh, it went elite power over gunning what i should have done in that last race is pro as again i could have fired my entire bankroll um and uh, you know, and I would have had a lot more, uh, a lot more money at the end. Um, I could have moved up the leaderboard a lot. And I'll get back to some of my takeaways here. Um, but I, I think overall, I played Saturday. You know, between uh, a one and a hundred, I probably played it eighty-five ish. Um, I I did lever up all my big opinions. Um, I did have a very nice day. I did score very well, um, and I finished very well. It just could have been better. Um, so things that I learned, stick to the plan. Um, I think this is the biggest one I'll beat myself up about. I was going to go all in on Augusto Dan, and I was going to use that hopefully capital when he wins to fire bigger later on some of my best opinions. Because I didn't go all in on Augusto Dan, I didn't have as much capital late to fire. Um, and I actually did a little bit of a, a mental exercise talking with Brian Duransky, who's a good friend, and I'm, I'm looking down at my notes here. Um, if I had played all on a ghost for a Dan and then doubled the daily double late size and then played like a 2,500, and I'll show you what I did play here. So if the, um, if I went on race eight, if I played um, a, you know, I, honestly, so in race eight, instead of playing that $250, oh, of course I don't note it, uh, that was a five over six, eight, 11 double. Instead of playing that double, if I had just taken that $750, added it to what I had in my bank account and pay, played, it would have been about a $3,000 win bet, um, which is gonna return, I don't know, nine-ish thousand dollars, a little over nine, nine, ten thousand dollars something like that. Um, I would have then had that money to fire at later sequences. So if I had done that, then taken and doubled the daily double size in um, in race 10, and then played probably like a $2,500 exacta instead of a $300 exacta late, um, I still would have had that $5,000 in reserve number that I talked about at the end. So not what, not betting everything in the last race, I still would have had a little capital um, pad, 
but instead of finishing where I did, I would have finished a lot ahead. And I'll give you those numbers when I get to the next page when I do the summation here. Um, so I didn't quite stick to my plan. I was a little frustrated about that. Um, I, I need to be a little more mentally prepared to lose everything, being okay, being all in. Um, I was one of our really good friends. He's a guy I hang out with a bunch in Saratoga during the summer and also somebody I talk a lot on uh, Discord with. Uh, and his name is Kevin. I won't, give a, I, won't, I won't give out any more information about who he is on Discord or anything else. But he is a guy who, extremely sharp handicapper, he's a professional horse player. And um, he ended up finishing second in the uh, in the BCBC. Um, I walked up behind him before that Augusta Rodan race, and he had I think he was had one ticket that had zero on it. And his second ticket, he had like forty three thousand dollars left on the ticket. I watched him walk up to a Mutel machine, punch his pin code in, win bet Augusta Rodan, put ten thousand dollars in, and then go repeat, repeat, repeat. He bet 43 grand on Augusta Rodin, so he went from 40 to 120 something thousand dollars. He made a massive move up, and for a while he was in first place. Um, that type of play is something you have to be mentally prepared to make because if Augusta Rodin doesn't win, he buys in for twenty thousand dollars and he paid out of pocket 20 grand. And you go away with nothing, and you have to be okay with that. And it's a, just a, it's a mental place you have to get to. Um, and I'm hoping a little experience helps me be a little better about that. Um, and I put, don't worry about money back. I was very concerned with having enough money in my account to make plays later on. I didn't want to get into a spot where um, I was making my best play, but I was going to then be able to be miss other, you know, nine and a half out of ten plays. I had my ten, my Augusta Rodin was ten out of ten, but. The later players were maybe nine or nine and a half out of 10. I didn't want to be all in on Augusta Rodin and then not be able to make those other plays. So I worried about leaving money in my account that was money back to make plays in the future. You can't, you can't, you can't think about that at all. You, you just really can't. Um, and the other thing that I have to say is think about the prize pool. Um, I completely disregarded the prize pool. I made that big play and we walked back into the room afterwards and um, and I'll show some photos here, but good friend Dave was with me and he, you know, we do the math and he looks at the board, he's like, dude, he's like, you're gonna finish like top 20. And I'm like, no, I'm not. I'm like, everybody else on that board is firing last race. They're all gonna be making massive moves forward. There's zero chance I make the money board. I made the board. Um, people did not play as aggressive late as I thought they would. I thought that that late sequence was so slammable that people were just going to absolutely print money. Um, and they didn't. And what I really needed to think about is I make three or four, uh, if I make even one of the, the, the changes that I talked about, either spending less money in spots I didn't love or wagering more in spots that I did love, I substantially move up that, that money board and um, there's a lot of money left. A lot of money left out there, I should say. There's a lot of money available to take. So, um, yeah, in summation, um, I ended up walking away with $48,365 in live money from my $7,500 starting stack. So, you know, not a bad, you know, two days at the office. Um, and I finished in 16th place, uh, which was $13,700 in prize pool. Um, now, the prize pool escalates quickly. If I was only a couple places further forward, I end up scoring absolutely massively. It would have been much, much bigger. Uh, and the math that I ran, if I, if I ran a sort of an optimized how I said I was gonna play going in strategy, and I'm looking down here at notes, um, it would have, I would have finished with about $125,000 instead of that $48,000. That would have put me into fourth place, which would have had a $102,000 um, uh, in prize pool money. Uh, that would have meant that the lambda between me playing how I played, which was 85% play maybe, and me playing 100% play was about $160,000. Um, and I think that I think that's about my ceiling. I think I think fourth place given the sequences and given my opinions is about as good as I could have done in this Breeders' Cup. Um, now, if I finished fourth, I would have been over the moon ecstatic because that really is life-changing money. Um, this was this is a very nice score and it's very good and I can't complain, but uh, the, there's a difference, right? So uh, photos from top to, uh, I'm gonna go clockwise on the photos. We'll start with the one of me looking back at the camera with um, wads of hundreds in front of me. What actually happened was I don't play on a Mutel kiosk 
ever, right? Like, all right, I don't go to a kiosk and have a wager or whatever. So I asked one of the guys on my table, and he's like, oh, go up, swipe your card, and he goes, and print voucher, and then walk your voucher up to somebody, and they'll cut you a check. So I walked to the machine. I actually had Dave over my shoulder because I had no idea how to do it. I'd never used those kiosks. Swipe in, hit print voucher. Voucher comes out, and, I, and the, the mutual clerk immediately to my left is available. So I step over, hand him the voucher. He looks at it, runs it through his machine, reaches down, and puts 40 grand up on the counter in front of me. And I, I kind of my jaw dropped. I was like, uh. So I ended up asking, I was like, can I get a check instead? And he's like, oh, yeah, yeah, yeah. Checks in the next aisle over. So before we pulled the money back, I had Dave get a photo of it because um, it's a, it's a, you know, it's a solid photo. That's a lot of cash. Um, next is Dave. Uh, if you are a Discord person, he is Writer Dave on Discord. Nicest guy you'd ever want to meet. Um, he played tour guide right out there. He brought me to a bunch of really cool restaurants. Gave me some tours of some of the ritzy, you know, uh, ritzy valley roads that have some of the crazy houses on them. And he was showing me, oh, you know, this house was in this movie and this house was in that movie and uh, these like crazy LA mansions. So it was pretty cool. I had a lot of fun hanging out with him. Um, third one over is my credit voucher for forty eight three sixty five. I, uh, you know, which is a, a pretty absurd voucher. I felt like I needed to get a photo of that one. And don't worry, you can't steal it. I've, I've already cashed that out. Uh, lower right corner is if you are a Discord person, PDT, um, Mike, who's a great guy, uh, ran into him, got a, got a little selfie. That's actually standing right in front of where the player's room was, which was at the top of the stretch on the third floor. Um, Next photo in the middle in front of the Breeders' Cup photo wall, that is me and it was Stephanie and Dan, both from Discord. Uh, they were both people that just, you know, you're, hey, I'm here. And they go, oh, well, I'm here too. And uh, just meeting up, chatting with people. I mentioned the having fun. A lot of this is just me having fun. This is, this is having an enjoyable time at the Breeders' Cup. And uh, the last one, the big photo, um, it's not the best because people were in the way and I couldn't get to where they weren't, but that is no balls in the winner's circle. Uh, we snuck down, believe it or not, Larry Ravelli's stepkids um, were upstairs around the BCBC area and they were, one of them had a no balls hat on. So I got chatting with him and said, hey, I'd love one of those hats. How do I get one? He's like, oh, I'll bring you a couple over tomorrow. Well, the horse gets to the winner's circle. I run down there hoping that they have extra hats, and uh, they didn't have any extra hats. So uh, I need, I did promise the one and only Chase Sessoms a no balls hat. I will need to scour eBay for one and make one appear. But overall, uh, about a $62,000 up weekend. I'm not going to complain about that, right? Like, that, that's good money. Nothing, it's hard to complain about that kind of a reward. Um, but I'm a competitive person and I'm a person that likes to learn from my mistakes or be better next time. So I learned a lot here and I think next time I'll be a more informed horse player. I'll be more planned. Um, normal day at the races, I'm very planned. I'm very structured. I'm very thought out. Um, Breeders' Cup betting challenge with that kind of pressure, that kind of pool. Uh, there's definitely, and also you know, just from the mental aspect, you know that you're sitting in a room with 500, you know, obviously there's 570 tickets, maybe there's 300 horse players. Those are probably 300 of the best horse players in the world. And you're competing versus them. And do you really belong? There's a little of that outsider complex thing going on, which is tough. It's very tough to get over that. So um, I finished 16th and I kind of went, oh, geez, maybe I actually do belong. I've been doing this all my life and maybe I really am one of these people. So um, hopefully you guys learned something. You learned about my structure. You learned about my plays, about how I thought about different things as the Breeders' Cup weekend went on. Uh, you know, if you like this kind of content, put a comment down below. I can make more of this kind of stuff when I do play tournaments. I'm playing tournaments a lot more these days because I've gotten myself into more of them. Uh, I will be playing, because I finished 16th, there were the top 15 entrants got an NHC berth um, because, and there were two people that were already double entered. So I am I get to go to the NHC, which is absolutely crazy. Um, not the tournament I wanted to play, but if you're going to give me a free entry, I'll definitely play it. Uh, so I get a free Vegas weekend to play that as well. So that'll be fun. And I uh, hopefully, uh, NHC is a little more laid back. I'll know my play is going in and hopefully I can do a little bit more content, which is uh, maybe YouTube shorts or some other types of stuff while I'm playing NHC because I'll have a little more time. So uh, until next time, guys, good luck at the races.